That verse is a great uh, uh, verse for uh, today's story, Perilous Times Shall Come. And, and um, last week we talked about uh, some missionaries in the, in the Philippines during World War II. And I think missionary service always um, brings with it a certain element of danger. Um, certainly missionaries are aware of that aspect as they as they are obedient you know, to God's call. I would imagine that most missionaries really think little of that. They don't worry about that. Um, uh, but um, last week we talked about uh, this, this um, group of missionaries in the Philippines after the World War II started and how that they were um, different, different things happened to them. But um, the, the biggest story was of the internment, imprisonment of um, a bunch of American missionaries there in Manila and how at the end of the war um, those heroic American troops uh, uh, stormed that, that um, prisoner of war camp and liberated those Baptist missionaries. That was in February of 1945, just, uh, just months before the war would be over. And uh, this morning I wanted to talk um, again about uh, Baptist missionaries in the Philippines during World War II. And, and this story um, has a little bit different, different ending, and I want to focus attention on, on 11 Baptist missionaries who were, were martyred in the Philippines uh, just about a year before last week's story, and they were, they were martyred in December of 1943. And, and this tragic account has been written about. Uh, the book is no longer available, but um, there's a, a book published in 1945 after the war um, titled Through Shining Archway, and it's the story of of these valiant missionaries and, and their struggle. And um, as I mentioned before, on, on December 7th, of course, we, uh, most of us know that date very well in our mind, December 7th, 1941, um, the, the islands of, the, of Hawaii were, were bombed by the Japanese. And the Japanese, because of that bombing and then their subsequent planning, um, they began to really, in essence, take over the entire uh, Pacific theater of war, really every, every nation in the Pacific. They were invading at the same time, or they had invaded just earlier before that, they had invaded China. Um, they, were, they were invading and occupying um, just about every country in the Pacific there uh, near Japan, and even in a sense they, they bombed Pearl Harbor to eliminate the base that America had there, uh, midway between, midway between America and, and uh, uh, Japan. And uh, of course, most Americans were, were um, caught. Um, they did not know that was going to happen, caught by surprise. And missionaries in those islands, if you can imagine, we, we would have hundreds and maybe thousands of American missionaries spread over that, that entire region during that time. And missionaries had, had nothing to do but just to wait and to minister, just to continue ministering. They didn't know what, what the outcome was going to be and if it even would affect them. But the Japanese were very aggressive and they began to take over country after country. As they approached uh, the Philippines and specifically this island of Panay uh, in the Philippines, the American uh, higher command had, had a, um, uh, a, a policy that when the Japanese were about to, to take over, uh, they called it a scorched earth policy, and you would know what that term means, that every building, every document, every piece of machinery had to be burned or destroyed so the Japanese could not take over anything and, and the enemy wouldn't get any of our secrets or machines, use them against us, you know, everything. So um, the, uh, the, the, the American command began to do that, and they, they burned and destroyed um, every, every uh, thing um, that was in, that the missionaries were around and using and the missionaries had to flee to the mountains. Um, there were 11 uh, people involved here, and I want to read their names. Um, they were Dr. and Mrs. Meyer, uh, Miss Jeannie Adams, uh, Mr. and Mrs. James Cavell, uh, Mr. and Mrs. Earl Rounds, and their young son, Earl Rounds, uh, Francis Rose, Miss uh, Singh Erickson, and Miss Dorothy Dow. So a mixture of married and single missionaries. And these names that I just read would be considered heroes and heroines um, of the faith, and we should, we should really honor them today as we hear their story. These are 11 adults and, and one young child. They were martyred then at the hands of Japanese on December 20th, 1943. This group initially was, a, was um, 
successful in fleeing, they had thought about this. They thought that perhaps, you know, things were, things had been in unrest for several years, and the missionaries thought, you know, if we ever had to go into hiding, and they, they found a place in the mountains um, that they called Hope Vale. They, had, they gave it a name. And um, there was a letter uh, written by Mr. Cavell that arrived at the mission board uh, in May of 1943. And um, he uh, told about this, this hideaway and how they had run to this hideaway. So, so we know that much about it. They had run to the mountains. They had prepared ahead of time deep into the mountains, an area that was in, he said, a deep, uh, beautiful gorge with giant trees growing in it. And they, they had made a little camp in there. It could only be reached by a winding and misleading trail that wound up and through the mountains. His letter went on to say, he said, we live, in grass, we live in a grass hut with bamboo floors. The people around us supply us with plenty to eat, the Filipino people. We have, um, we've had a good spring. The Japanese came very close to us one day in February, and we have had to move out three times to hide. We have plenty of books to read that we brought with us and reread. We live like natives here. We have rice with every meal, greens every day, bananas, uh, usually eggs, sometimes chicken. Once in a while, we'll, we'll have some beef or pork. But our prospects for freedom and seeing you all again are most uncertain. And unfortunately, that was the last communication that, that we have from that missionary camp as that letter somehow made its way back to, to America. But it took almost a year for that letter to make its way to America. Well, as I said, the communication stopped and um, uh, personnel and fam personnel in the United States, uh, you know, uh, mission personnel and, and uh, of course their families became more and more concerned as they didn't hear from them. And finally, their fears were realized. And in March of 1944, a message came from one of the government offices in Washington that, um, and it read this, he said, this office regrets to inform you that information believed to be reliable has been received, which indicates that, that, uh, that this family, the Cavells, died in Japanese custody on the island of Panay, uh, December 20th, 1943. Now, as the war wore down, if you think about that, where uh, by the time they reached this, they had this, uh, this communication from Washington, the war is, is almost over. It's kind of sad that uh, this happened right before, right after this, right after this killings, uh, the war it comes to an end right after that. But uh, the, uh, the State Department, uh, in the weeks that followed, um, began notifying uh, immediate uh, family members to inform them of the deaths of their loved one. And of course, during, uh, well, during this time, the State Department had insisted on a silence uh, on, on, about this for fear the Japanese would, would uh, become more vigilant and, um, and then they would find out where these reports were coming from and possibly kill those people. So of course, families and missions officials, they, they held uh, tenaciously to the idea that hopefully this is just rumor, you know, in war, uh, especially back in this time, with almost no communication during this time um, between those areas and, and in the United States. You know, you pray and hope that there's mistakes, because there always were mistakes in, in uh, communication. And um, however, the day finally came that um, the, um, the general secretary of some Filipino churches um, said that, he, he wrote this letter, he said that he confirmed that all, all the missionaries indeed um, had, had died, as well as five other Americans, and again, put to death in December of 1943. A local Baptist pastor, a Filipino pastor, had made his way to the camp. As soon as it was safe, he, they were aware of, of what happened, and this is where we hear the, know some of the story. Um, and he, um, he found the bodies, and he interred the bodies in, in really a formal Christian burial there. Um, in decency and honor, and um, local Filipinos who, who had followed the events and who knew what was happening uh, reported that the Japanese, what they had done is they had gone to the, the Filipino people in the area and they had, had threatened and asked them if they heard anything about any missionaries, and they had gone, they had, they had fanned out to thousands of people to, to just find bits of information because they knew the missionaries were there, they knew they were hiding, and they wanted to find them. Um, that was not successful. Uh, no one, no one of all those thousands of people led on to the Japanese that, where the missionaries were. It's kind of, that's kind of interesting how, how secret they were able to keep that. However, the Japanese just day after day searched those mounds, eventually found the, the encampment. Uh, when they found the encampment, a lot of the men members uh, of the party were able to, to escape and they ran into the woods, but when, the, when their wives and, and the child was caught, the men 
surrendered, went back to be with their wives, uh, realizing that maybe they could protect them, um, stop what they, they hoped wasn't inevitable. But the Japanese informed them um, that they all were under a death warrant, and the missionaries asked if they might have just some time to pray together. And so the Japanese said, yes, you can have an hour. And uh, whoever witnessed this said this about that. He said the, the missionaries uh, knelt together, um, prayed for an hour, uh, thanking God for the time they could serve him there in that, in that part of the world. After the hour was over, they stood uh, unitedly. They, they stepped forward and they declared, now we are ready. And with that, all of them were executed. Um, one missionary, one, one author said, the missionaries were slain and heaven was enriched. And, um, you know, just a, kind of a, a sobering story, a different story than last week, but a story that we should hear and know and, and honor these folks that in modern times were martyred uh, for Christ. And, you know, um, missionary life is never easy. I've never been a missionary, but I have friends, dear friends that, that, that are and have been missionaries. And, and uh, again, um, Thankfully, um, we don't have uh, a lot of martyrdom in our, in our day and time today, but we want to really take the time, and I think that uh, sometimes the world sees it as that, that, that these folks were in the wrong place at the wrong time, and maybe they lose their freedoms or their life, but, but actually, God sends these missionaries forth, and God sends missionaries forth, and he never makes a mistake. And so we want to remember that, and even in stories that are um, like this, um, of God's leading and, and how he does lead and the, the valiant heroics of these, of these men and women.